What's up, everybody? It is G Mr. Drew here to welcome you to another episode of the Andrew Kloszewski Experience. This is going to be episode 146, I believe. And we're going to continue with what I've been working on as far as like this whole study series that I'm doing for this uh, super complex uh, character slash characters. And, you know, just getting reference for military things, but also I just jumped into doing, like, uh, like, Frazetta Girdles, just because Frazetta has a plethora of studies for, like, old barbarian type stuff. So in order to kind of work on those and, and try to study and understand those and see how those girdles work, because I don't understand the technology behind it, it's easy to imagine just throwing a cloth on and then tying it with a rope. Um... But I just wanted to kind of capture a lot of it to see, you know, just to, just to uh, understand it a lot more and be able to uh, draw it on a dime if need, need be. So let me adjust my camera. And yeah, man, let's, uh, let's just dive into it. I wonder... The camera's still pretty high up. Let me let me get it lower. Oh, you can see. See, the further I extend this armature, the more the more it leans down from just gravity pulling down on it. There we go. So this will kind of work. And yeah. We're down to the bottom four squares, so hopefully I'll just finish this page by the time I'm done. And, uh... Oh, okay. Sorry. I just got a message. Uh, some award that I just won. Nothing, nothing super, super special. Nothing worth, uh, mentioning, I guess, but that's cool. Uh, either way, I'm just gonna get started, and I'm gonna continue just drawing some barbaric girdles and things like that. I, you know, I'm, if I don't get to the belts and everything that I wanted to, uh, I'll just do it on another page. You know, I might do this for three or four pages coming. I know I have a can of fixative somewhere, and I may need to start spraying that uh, for all these pages with all this lead on here, because I know with all the uh, rendering that I'm doing with these, some of these at least, like the pages are going to start getting dirty. Uh, so I, I need to like hit them up with some fixative. I need to go open up that box that I have with all my spray cans. Everything is all boxed away. Uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, once I... Uh, I'm just going to continue doing this, and I'll, I'll probably do, like, a few pages of these. So hopefully you guys are enjoying it. Um, you know, it's just me studying and recreating what's already there. So, you know, I kind of speed through these things. You know, there's not really too much creativity involved. It's all just uh, uh, just just study and, and recreation. So, yeah, I have a wisecrack playing in the background. They're talking about Mortal Kombat. And then after that, I believe it's a whole bunch of Wisecrack videos and then uh, the Rad Brad playing Resident Evil 8. So I'm just going to let all that stuff roll while I work. Mortal Kombat fully embraces the ridiculous, even and maybe especially in its most violent moments. And the 1995 film called The State Ethos. And not just when you were watching there the we go. puppet get owned by a single punch to the moment. <laughs> There we go. Now we got something. Ah, you know what? Let me raise my microphone so it's out of my way. There we go. Get the microphone out of the way so I can draw a little more freely. Outrageous renders it effectively a spectacle. Though camp has become much of the mainstream in recent decades, appearing in everything from Desperate Housewives to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 
It originated in queer subcultures as far back as the 18th century. The aesthetic became a way to use camp's irony, theatricality, parody, and humor to cope with and combat social stigma. In Susan Sontag's notes on camp, she identifies the camp aesthetic in various cultural products, ranging from Tiffany's lamps to actress Greta Garbo. The unifying theme here is that they all broadcast their own theatricality and articles. The films of John Waters are also a prime example of campiness, delivering wretched, often filthy excess with a Lucille Blue style wig. All in all, camp is, simply put, Camp culture, in some ways, is an attack on high culture, according to Sontag, in that it asserts that good taste is not simply good taste, that there exists indeed a good taste of bad taste. Now, campiness permeates just about every frame of the 1995 Mortal Kombat film. That's why... This guy's holding a shield, so... I'm gonna keep that in there. The reason has become clear in the opening moments, when we see an overdramatically rendered fight framed in top canted or dramatically tilted angles. It's punctuated by sound effects that are much too loud. I rounded out with absurd performances like Oh, and then his face turns into a skeleton and if that's not too much, I don't know what it is. When this guy's eyes pull on switches, that's him. When a giant skull appears in the sky through less than convincing CGI effects, that's also him. This one more do you want? Total camp. And when the camera literally tilts under this guy's crotch just as he's uh, asserting his masculinity, you better believe that's camp. But did the filmmakers do all of this on purpose? That question raises an important tension within the camp aesthetic. Intentionality. According to Sontag, sometimes camp is completely naive, happening by mistake and resulting in failed seriousness. The room, of course, is an absolute masterclass in this. Just a chicken. Chip, 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 chip. Other times, as with any performance by the actress Divine in a John Waters film, the campiness is the intention. The creators are in on the joke. What's interesting about Mortal Kombat is that it feels like we're seeing instances of both kinds of camp within one film, which is pretty unusual. The campy performance by Christopher Lambert as Lord Raven feels pretty purposeful. There's just no way he wanted you to take his character completely seriously, if seriously at all. In moments like these, the film feels like it's subconsciously trying to be camp. It's what you're saying. As a mean a dash of hops, a splash of citrus, a line of kugels, flavored and all. The video game's absurdities. But there are other moments where you can sense a failed attempt at seriously carrying out a cinematic gesture, like this divine moment when a ninja comes up to fight but trips over himself just a little bit. <laughs> moments like that failed seriousness somehow make the film more lovable. The absurdity of Mortal Kombat's camp aesthetic is a big part of why it's remained such a cult classic. Oh, and also heads going on. This is why we were puzzled to see how the screenwriter behind the remake approached retelling the story. He told Polygon that, with something like Mortal Kombat, where we're talking about soul-sucking sorcerers, it can very easily slip into camp. So right away, he's rejecting some of Mortal Kombat's DNA. He continued. I love the 95 film, but it drips in nacho cheese. But we were in 2021, and we wanted to deliver a movie that felt more authentic, a little more realistic. I mean, realistic isn't the first word that comes to mind when I see this. But okay, the decision to lean out from the camp factor is not so. The overall aesthetics of the newest installment are less colorful, less zany, and less punctuated with over-the-top set designs. Instead, and despite clearly having a bigger budget, the new film exercises far more visual restraint, settling for darker, bearer shots, and simpler production design. Also, quite a bit of it takes place in the real world, which is depicted quite unremarkably. The camera angles air on the side of conventional, as compared to its predecessors' aforementioned widely canted angles and occasional brush. The total differences between the two films are obvious from the first moments of the new film, which don't include the glorious theme song, but rather set up a true family tragedy. In the 1995 version, you can see his brother get murdered, the fighting is over the top, rendered a near total caricature by the performances. It's not trying to tug at your heartstrings. In the new version, a woman and her child are murdered off screen by a killer ice guy in a moment conveyed through this guttural cry for help. Her husband, upon finding them dead, 
seeks a tearful revenge against the attackers, only to tragically be defeated. Here, they've built up a genuine drama which sets the tone for a film that is definitely not going to embrace the group factor. Except, Mortal Kombat isn't supposed to be about killing people's families. It's about melting a person's face with acid. And it feels like a bit of a contradiction to make an eternally serious and gritty film when you literally have a character whose magical power is having a killer act. We can also see these kinds of problems in more one-to-one -one comparisons. Take the way Kano is murdered in each film. In the first, he's put into a deadly crotch hole, says, Hawk in the front, and promptly has his neck broken by the sheer force of Sonya's thighs. It's ridiculous. It's goofy. In the new version, called her Sonya. See if I could find something else. I want to try to get out of this guy's like sketches. I feel like I've gotten enough of those, and maybe try to find some of the finer art that he did, so I can kind of capture a little more detail. You know. Let me 
I mean, if I'm gonna sit here and pause, at least let me put the book on on stream, right? See what I mean? So we're still in like his sketches and things like that. Oh yeah, I wanted to just point this one out when I was looking through it last night. Was uh, looking at this picture here. I, what is it? Um, it's an ink. It's ink artwork. But man, this is awfully reminiscent of of Jay Lee's style. And Jay Lee, well, obviously he came after Frank Frazetta, so uh, you know Jay Lee's style seems to be awfully reminiscent of this. Just looking at the how everything is so liney, how there's lines rendering everything. Everything looks like it's like fluid and liquid, like it's almost dripping, you know. And and how everything is rendered out with all these lines. This this. Uh, uh, less cross hatching and more line work. Uh, let me see, real quick. Um, I'll, I'll find one of my uh, Dark Tower pieces, and I hope that they have like his his raw pencils in the uh, in the back of the graphic novel, so I can compare Jay Lee's stuff with this stuff. Because I mean, this really looks like uh, Jay Lee's depiction of um, Roland Deshawn of, I, I believe that's how you pronounce the name, uh, Roland, the main character of the Dark Tower series. Like, this looks just like him. And then the style of everything here looks just like it. And, I mean, quite honestly, uh, well, let me just go grab the art book. So I, that way I can go continue to talk about that. But yeah, when I saw this, I was just like, holy shit, look how dope this is. But give me a second. Now, I have the first four books of uh, Stephen King's The Dark Tower series, the first four graphic novels. Uh, this is the first one, The Gunslinger Born. And yeah, I didn't, I, I bought like the fifth and sixth. I, I forget how many I actually bought, but I guess they switched to artists and then they had those artists try to do their own, their best Jay Lee impression in order to keep the artwork. Um, oh yeah, they do have the rough pencils back here. Perfect. So yeah, let me, uh, let me show these. I'll, I'll continue to play Wisecrack, but I'll turn the volume down on it so that way I don't lose. So give me a second to set this up. Oh, production. The stream's production is so, so good. Am I right? Okay. So while that's playing on mute in the background, let me just talk about these for a little bit. And let me see if I can, how far back his pencils go. Okay, so that was it. So yeah, man, look at this old Frank Frazetta thing. This was done, uh, man, I'm, I'm not seeing a year here. So... It is what it is, unless that says 66 down here, these little lines right here. I don't know if that says like 66, maybe, just really, really tiny. Um, but yeah, man, I'd, I want to say this is probably around his uh, Tarzan days, but look at this artwork and like look at Jay Lee's stuff over here. I love Jay Lee's artwork. This is the reason why I got into the Dark Tower series is I just kind of picked, you know, back when I found a comic book shop for the first time, I just started uh, opening up books and, and looking through them. And if I liked the artwork, I would buy it. And I didn't know anybody. Fortunately, I was a Spawn fan from the movie. So I picked up the Spawn book and Greg Capullo was working on it. And, you know, I don't need to talk about Greg Capullo's work. Anybody who's aware of him, like, you know, he's like top of the line. So... Uh, you know, I got into Spawn, um, the Udon comic artist, the guys who work on like Street Fighter and Darkstalkers and all that Capcom uh, comic book stuff. Those guys are great. And I, I'm a Street Fighter fan, so I opened up that comic book, saw the artwork, and started getting into that. So that's how, I, you know, I got into things. And same thing with, um, with, uh, um, 
you know, the, this Dark Tower series. I had no idea what it was. You know what I mean? Didn't know, didn't care. I like the artwork. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to start reading. I'm going to enjoy this. And it's a great story, man. I, I really enjoyed it. I never finished it because once I realized that the books 5, 6, 7, and 8, they started doing less Jay Lee and more other artists and the art kind of took a dip. I was like, you know, what? I don't even care about the story. Like, I care more about the art. Um, even though it's a, I'm sure it's a good story, maybe I'll actually buy the novel and read the novel instead. You know what I mean? Like, I, I buy these graphic novels for the artwork. Um, you know, for the story as much as I can and to study comic book panels as much as I can. Like, you know, uh, one thing that I noticed uh, the more I read these things, because I've read this uh, Dark, uh, Dark Tower series, at least the four books that I have, I've read them multiple times. And the more I read them, the more I realized, like, Jay Lee doesn't really do backgrounds too often. Like, you, you see, he kind of has, like, some rocks and stuff like that back here. Um, and, you know, he kind of has, like, you, you see the horizon line is off camera towards the bottom. But, um, you know, a little bit. But he, he kind of does minimal stuff. I even bought his Superman Batman uh, that he did for DC. And kind of and notice there too, like he he keeps the background, and it's not to say like oh his work isn't that good, like he must not be good at backgrounds. He he's good at what he does. He he does characters, and he renders out these creepy monstrous looking things. Like he just knows how to really use shadow and things like that, and everything just looks like it's dripping. Like look at this guy's eyebrow, like it's insane. Like even the eyes and everything like that. Like, it's insane. So, I really love his style. And me, as somebody who sucks at doing environments, like, studying this kind of helps me. Like, okay, you don't necessarily have to be perfect or, or know how to do environments in order to do comics. Like, you just kind of have to know what you need to know in order to accomplish what you want to do, which is what makes uh, Jay Lee's work on Superman Batman really interesting because it's modern day, it's downtown, there's cities, there's buildings, you know, um, all that other stuff. And the way I, I bought the books and I literally studied how he did those, how, how he did the artwork in there. And yeah, of course, there's like some backgrounds in there. Uh, but yet, yeah, how he's able to just focus on character and just make this atmosphere. I remember, I think, when the first book opened, I, I have the book, I can, I can kind of, uh, yeah, let me, let me block this. So just so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, so you see, like, he really focuses on characters, characters, and, and anatomy is always, like, what's in the forefront. And then, like, props and environments are kind of in the background, but he, he does them so stylized. Uh, let me, let me show you what I mean. Uh, see, like I bought this uh, Batman Superman Cross World, and here's uh, some more J. Lee art of this stuff. And the reason why I wanted to do it is because it's like, okay, I like his style, and now I know him for his style, but I want to see him tackle characters that I know, because I don't know this Darkstalker series. So I don't know how true to form he is, or Dark Stalkers, Dark, Dark Tower. I don't know the Dark Tower series, so I don't know how true to form he's being to the characters. But I want to show you something that I saw when I when I first started looking at at this stuff. So you see, same thing. He focuses a lot on character and environments and stuff, kind of take a background. But he does enough to play with the negative and positive space to give you enough information. But I, I think it's in the very beginning, the shot that I want to go to. Because I was like, oh man, how is Jay Lee going to tackle Gotham or Metropolis when he doesn't really do city stuff? And this is what's beautiful. Um, you know, he has the, this dark side, beautiful dark side picture. Comic art, Wonder Woman on Pegasus. Like, it's all beautiful. But check this out. Well... Here's the uh, pencils of the, I mean, one day, but one day I'd love to be able to just kind of do stuff like this on my own. Um, hopefully all this reference and studies that I'm doing is going to help with that. But you, you see how, you know, props and environment takes a background. It's just kind of like a set piece. You can almost make a statue out of these things. And, uh, 
you know, everything is so wet and drippy. Look at this cape, you know what I mean? And then his forms and shapes and his, uh, his shading is, is very stark, you know? It just jumps, or, or big, high contrast. And then he, he just uses really drippy lines to create this kind of gray area, you know? I, I love his style. So I wanted to see how he would tackle downtown because I'm like, how, how is Jay Lee gonna draw an environment? And I mean, look how stylized he does this. He, he draws these airships that look like fish swimming in the sky. And then he, he makes up literally a panel. How art, artistic is that? That he, he does like a panel and with this gothic style framing and to match the, the city and everything like that. And this might even be uh, Clark Kent walking through Gotham. I don't know. That's why he looks so out of place. And I think that's what it was, is because he went he was going to go meet Bruce. And but look at this. All all you have is characters. So, you know, the thing that he's always drawing. And a park bench. But look how a park bench. Uh, a, a bench in, in a park. And look how stylized. And I mean, this just says Gotham City all over it. There's gargoyles in the playground or, or wherever he's at in this park. You have these dead trees that are super stylized. Like, like this is what I bought the book for. I wanted to see how he, he was going to tackle Gotham and if he was actually going to draw environments and backgrounds. And he kind of draws like set pieces, less so than actual environments. You may see like there's no skyline, there's no buildings in the background. It's all so atmospheric, you know, it looks like... And, you know, I'm sure that that style just speaks to him and it highlights what he works on. So it was like a breath of fresh air to me to see that he does this because now it, it just gave me the hope of like, OK, as much as I want to study and learn environments in order to be able to draw them, like I may take a page out of Jay Lee's book and draw the stylized background stuff. It's just, you know, he has such a cool style when it comes to drawing uh, like people and characters and things like that but how cool is this this guy in green is uh bruce wayne and that's clark kent going to gotham park to go uh to go meet him uh, are we focused yeah we are it's just probably just shit quality from my stream or something but yeah you know so i'm a huge jay lee fan i think that's pretty obvious and he, a guy like him gives me hope that it's like, okay, you know, maybe treat environments and everything like that, like set pieces when it comes to me, actually, when I, when I go to illustrate my comic book and focus on characters. Cause that's what I like to draw. That's what I enjoy drawing and, and things like that. You know what I mean? But he definitely does enough. And it's not to say that he never draws environments because I mean, here you have the, the, the alleyway. Where, where Bruce Wayne's parents got gunned down, you know, uh, Crime Alley. And he rendered that out. So he's clearly he's capable of doing these things. He just doesn't, you know, for one reason or another. You know, I'm sure he has his own things. But look how stylized these panels are, you know, with the gothic, the gothic framing and everything like that. It's so good. And, you know, you get a bit of a skyline, but everything, it, man, Jay Lee is just so cool, man. And then you have this super dope, again, super drip going on with the texturing. But, yeah, that's what I mean when it, when it comes to, like, Jay Lee's artwork. I, I, I just buy whatever he works on just so I can study it. I don't have any of the old Inhuman stuff. I believe that's where he kind of started and things like that. I don't have any of that. But I have like his later stuff, like this Dark Tower and his Batman Superman. I even have the uh, Transformers G.I. Joe that he did. And I love that fucking book. I love that book. Just like uh, his work is giving me hope on environments, uh, his work gave me hope on robots too. Because... I'm not, I'm big on anatomy, but I suck at doing like robotic things like vehicles and all that other stuff, all the straight edges and all that other stuff. So yeah, let me, you know, just flip through the book and you can see like everything always focuses on figures 
and less so on environments. But the environment is enough of a play with uh, negative and positive space. And then it's just so stylized. Everything is, you, you know what I mean? But it's like, hey, you focus on this. And then this is just serving as a set piece. But there's no... You know what I mean? He's not drawing like super clouds in the background. He's not drawing mountains in the, in the distance. It's just like, look at these creepy people meeting up in this creepy place. And, and it's beautiful. It gives me hope. So going back to the, the Frazetta stuff and when I was looking through this book and, and seeing it, I was just like, holy shit. Like, so we have like this Tarzan picture here. I don't think this is Tarzan, but something is around that time. And just looking at how all this is being treated with the heavy contrast and how everything looks like wet and drippy. And then all these lines that are, you know, giving detail to these beasts face. But the one thing that I see going on here that I don't see in Jay Lee's work is the background rendering. Now, this seems to be like some framing with the tree trunk and the branches and everything like that. But still, there's a lot of attention, just as much attention going into the background here as there is to the characters. Like, there's an equal rendering. There's a 50-50 balance between environment and characters and things like that. Um, and, you know, where Jay Lee's is, like, all about, to me, it's all about the character and everything else kind of takes a background. But I, maybe that's an unfair comparison. Maybe Jay Lee just found a style that works and he sticks to it, you know. But just looking at, looking at this and looking at that, like all this, all all the line, how everything is so liney. Like look at this fabric here and look at the hair. Everything has these lines. It is so reminiscent of like this wolf's face, you know. And then how all the clothes have the these kind of lines. Everything is so liney. I love it. I love it. But yeah, you know, so when I, I remember when I was going through this yesterday, I saw this and I was like, you know what, maybe I'll, I'll just take a minute out of my stream to kind of break down these things. You know, I, I have a huge collection of books that I've collected over the years and, you know, I, I pop them open from time to time to uh, to keep me focused and keep me inspired. I mean, look at this heavy contrast, all this dark. You know what I mean? Like some of these things look like those old Renaissance paintings. You know what I mean? Just in pencil format. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it also just goes to speak about Frazetta and what he was doing and how, how much he's like established. I would be interested in knowing what Jay Lee's uh, relationship with Frazetta artwork is, you know? Because it's... You know, I just love it. Like, it makes me wonder, like, what the hell's going on here? Like, it doesn't matter, does it? You know, if this was Spawn's cape, if this, I, I'm, I don't know if this is hair or if it's, uh, like, a cloth that this lady's wearing over her head, you know, off rip, um, that goes to speak to his style and everything. But, like, this doesn't really make sense. It looks like poetic uh, or, like, wax being poured into a bowl. You know what I mean? It doesn't look like hair that's just drooping, that's just hanging. And it doesn't look like it's hair that's being blown by a fan or anything like that either. It's, it's like there's an actual shape to it. You know? And it's like, it doesn't make sense. But he's, he's made it so that it doesn't need to. You know, it creates layering from this piece to the face to this so that the face face is framed in between, you know, I'm, let's just call it hair. The face is framed by the hair here. And then, yeah, you know, it, it, it's just such a good layout. Face, hands, and then another face down here. Either way, I'm, I'm, now I'm just going on too long about this, but I thought it was interesting when I saw it, and I thought it was worth uh, talking about, you know what I mean? Oh, see, like, here's Roland Deshawn. Like, like, let's just talk about it. I was saying how much he looks like this main character, which is why I thought about it. Like, you look at this guy, and you look at this guy, and you're like, oh, okay, this is the same book. This is the same story. This is all happening from one page to another, right? And it's like, nah, these things are like 50, 
60 years apart from, from each other. <laughs> and from two different artists. So I remember when I saw this, it just really told, struck me as uh, the Dark Tower, even though, you know, it has like monkeys and wolves in it, where the Dark Tower has more like spiders and, and bats. But yeah, I, you know, just, I, I'm done. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, lesson, le lesson over. Not that there was any lesson, not that I did teach anybody anything. Uh, I, I just uh, like to share the things that I'm doing and want to, you know, it's like, it's like what they say about like teaching people or anything like that, like being a teacher, you, you're, as you teach other people, you continue to teach yourself, you know what I mean? And get, and continue to give yourself a better understanding of what it is that you're doing. And since I'm doing a study, like, yeah, I'm going to take a break and I'm going to talk about some other stuff and then, you know, but now it's, it's back to it back to these uh, Frazetta girdle studies so I can try to understand um, a little bit better, just cement it into my mind. Just like what's happening and what's going on here. Well, I'm really hoping to find like a nice rendered piece. Everything is, uh, you know, not so focused. And like women's, I don't really have to do too much just because women's is kind of like, you know, it's a thong, it's a bikini. So it's like, you know, I can draw a thong and then, and, and then change, switch it up and change it um, however I need to. You know, if you think about like Red Sonia, um, see, check that out. Now here's some more Native American things. And it has like the similar belt as uh like like this one where they're wearing a belt and then it has like the 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 chapped pants. So many nudes. Why are there so many nudes? Okay, there we go. Maybe I could fit these two in one. So we have two, and if this one's here, and then that one would be kind of here. Try to get two in one. Just because it's interesting. You know, something that I always like try to think about while working on this stuff. Oh, yeah, let me. Uh... Probably prepare to turn YouTube back, back up. is the the functionality and the one that I'm going to I'm about to start drawing now has like a woman with a belt or a woman with like a you know something like a girdle on she's you know super naked and um but she has a knife tucked into the waistband but the knife is unsheathed so it's like just a metal blade that's sticking to her skin and it's like man I don't know I don't know if she could like run like that I feel like that and especially since the blade is like curved, it's like, I don't know, that one end can poke her and the other end can slice her. I don't, I don't know if that's the smartest, smartest thing. No, whatever.
also offering windows of love, sort of like Uncle Jesse. Moreover, understanding Sony as a martyr explains why the ending of Infinity War is such a gut punch. Sounds good, Sony. As Thanos snaps and Peter Parker fades away, we know in our hearts that Tony would have given anything for their roles to have been reversed. But Tony doesn't remain the martyr forever, as we see in Endgame. Sure, he starts the film still very much in that role. Now a loving parent who's just happy that he and his family are spared. center of the universe. While he initially doesn't want to do superhero stuff anymore, he must learn to put his own happiness aside for the greater good. But he must also come to recognize his place in that universe. When all hope seems lost in the fight against Thanos, it's telling that Doctor Strange, gay yeah, depicts himself, looks to Tony and gestures he won. This is a callback to Infinity War, in which Strange said that there was only one scenario in which they could beat Thanos. How many did you see? 14 million 600. One. <laughs> one. Realizing they are in that one reality, Tony accepts the role he must play. I am inevitable. Thank you. 
this book, but did not look there. Man is literally split in two. He has an awareness of his own splendid uniqueness and that he sticks out of nature with the power and majesty, and yet he goes back into the ground a few feet in order blindly and dumbly to rot and disappear forever. But since we can't overcome our own impending death, we feel compelled to counter it, at least symbolically. For Becker, this is heroin. The desire to make something of your life, to be remembered, and in the process, reach a sort of symbolic immortality. Building off this philosophy, it's not surprising that the DCEU would venerate the warrior aspect, in large part because of this archetype, as Pearson notes, amounts to a rejection of death. The warrior goes forth, slays the dragon, and returns with the life saving elixir. Whether it's the epic of Gilgamesh or Die Hard, we see this archetype return over and over again because we, as human beings, want to be reassured that we too can conquer death. And taken in this context, the DCEU's highly stylized, symbol-laden world begins to make a lot more sense. We watch these larger-than-life heroes embody our literal hopes and dreams while fighting back the embodiments of certain doom. In contrast, Marvel chooses to situate its cinematic universe in our own reality. Now, we're not going to say that the MCU is light on symbols because that's simply not true. But because Marvel is more interested in telling stories that are couched in real life, we see architects who focus on accepting, not rejecting, in fact, one of the biggest lessons the martyr will learn to embrace is their own talent. Sure, Captain America might help save the day, but what happens after? He gives up the superhero identity that has dominated his whole life in order to live out the rest of his days with his long lost love, Peggy Carter. And this moment resonates with us on a very different level when compared to the one with the DCEU, precisely because Steve Rogers chose to live a quiet, normal life with the one he loved, very much like any of us would. He's old, he's frail, and he's entirely human, and it gets your right in your feelings. In contrast, it's pretty much impossible to picture any hero from the DCEU hanging up their costumes for a life of domestic bliss, or getting day drunk playing video games with their friends. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Do you think given time the DCEU will reach past the warrior archetype? Or does this matter because this epilogue implies that the acceptance of death is going to be far away? Let us know in the comments. Big thing to our patrons for all your support. Hit that subscribe button like you're Stephen Strange driving on a windy road at night, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later. something that's been dishing out fatalities since 1992. That's right. Now, we're longtime fans of the game, and even have a soft spot for the often ridiculed 1995 film. So we are pretty jazzed for a 2021 reboot and the opportunity to hear on the big screen. But as the end credits rolled, something just wasn't sitting right. No misunderstandings. It brings a certain level of fun and spectacular blood squirting. And that might be all you want from a Mortal Kombat movie, which is fine. But we'd argue that the movie misunderstands a basic appeal of Mortal Kombat that the 1995 version mostly got right. We'll explain in this Wisecrack edition on Mortal Kombat what went wrong. And, spoilers ahead, for the Mortal Kombat Extended Universe. And before we jump into it, I wanted to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Ray Shadow Legends. If you don't know, Ray is an awesome hero collector RPG where you can collect champions and battle up against friends or players online. We've been playing Raid for a while now here at Wisecrack, so we've been able to collect a lot of champions. Some of my faves include the epic Battle Sage and the legendary Astromon. They are essential to my clan. Battle Sage places an increased attack buff on all allies and removes all debuffs on allies and places a revival on death buff for all your teammates, which can be so helpful. Collecting heroes and building up my team is one of my favorite parts of the game. You can really plan a strategy before heading against some of the tougher campaigns. The game is constantly updating, so there's always something new to do. This month, they've released 11 new Amazing Champions, and now there are almost 200 brand new missions to complete, with an exclusive Legendary Champion as your reward. If that's not enough, they added 5 tough new levels to almost every dungeon. Ready to play some raid and check out everything the game has to offer? Click the links in the description to download the game for iOS, Android, or PC today. And now, 
understand what makes for a good Mortal Kombat film adaptation, we first need to look at what made the game so beloved in the first place. Beyond the basic game mechanics, there's a joy in discovering all the fatalities, the seemingly inexplicable pop-up of a guy saying, and the je ne sais quoi of impaling your opponent on a floor of spikes. Mortal Kombat differs from other fighting games largely because of its blend of humor, self-awareness, and joyful over-the-topness in everything from the costume design to the character concepts. Compare that to a competitor like Street Fighter, a relatively straightforward fighting game that, while featuring a green dude who electrocutes you, generally takes itself pretty seriously. By contrast, whether you're turning your opponent into a literal baby or just turning them into your new best friend, Mortal Kombat fully embraces the ridiculous, even, and maybe especially, in its most violent moments. And the 1995 film followed the same ethos, and not just when you were watching a six-limb puppet get owned by a single punch to the groin. <laughs> set design to its performances, the film is nothing if not over the top. In this way, both the game and the original film are excellent examples of the camp aesthetic. And I'm not talking about bent tent poles and damp sleeping bags. Now, camp is a word that gets tossed around a lot in film book circles, but it's worth really examining what it means. As Helen A. Shugart and Catherine Egley Wagon explain, camp is an over-the-top, playful, and parodic aesthetic, and its use of the exaggerated, ostentatious, outrageous, renders it, effectively, a spectacle. Though camp has become virtually mainstream in recent decades, appearing in everything from Desperate Housewives to Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it originated in queer subcultures as far back as the 18th century. The aesthetic became a way to use camp's irony, theatricality, parody, and humor to cope with and combat social stigma. In Susan Sontag's notes on camp, she identifies the camp aesthetic in various cultural products, ranging from Tiffany's lamps to actress Fred and Margo. The unifying theme here is that they all broadcast their own theatricality and artifice. Films of John Waters are also a prime example of campiness, delivering wretched, often filthy excess with a Lucille Booth style wing. All in all, camp is, simply put, camp culture in some ways is an attack on high culture, according to Sontag, in that it asserts that good taste is not simply good taste, that there exists indeed a good taste of bad taste. Now, campiness permeates just about every frame of the 1995 Mortal Kombat film. That's why, even though the film was not particularly well received when it first came out, it's retained a serious cult following. The reasons become clear in the opening moments, when we see an over-dramatically rendered fight framed in over-the-top canted or dramatically tilted angles. It's punctuated by sound effects that are much too loud. turns into a skeleton, and if that's not too much, I don't know what it is. When this guy's eye full-on twitches, that's camp. When a giant skull appears in the sky through less than convincing CGI effects, that's also camp. This, what more do you want? Total camp. And when the camera literally tilts under this guy's crotch just as he's uh, asserting his masculinity, you better believe that's camp. But did the filmmakers do all of this on purpose? That question raises an important tension within the camp aesthetic, intentionality. According to Sontag, sometimes camp is completely naive, happening by mistake and resulting in failed seriousness. The room, of course, is an absolute masterclass in this. It's just a chicken. Chip, 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 chip. Other times, as with any performance by the actress Divine in a John Waters film, the campiness is the intention. The creators are in on the joke. What's interesting about Mortal Kombat is that it feels like we're seeing instances of both kinds of camp within one film, which is pretty unusual. The campy performance by Christopher Lambert as Lord Raven feels pretty purposeful. There's just no way he wanted you to take his character completely seriously, if seriously at all. In moments like these, the film feels like it's self-consciously trying to be camp. That's how you see it. The deal is the deal. Made a choice. As a means of leaning into the video game's absurdities. But there are other moments where you can sense a failed attempt at seriously carrying out a cinematic gesture, like this divine moment when a ninja comes up to fight but trips over himself just a little bit. <laughs> moments like that, of failed seriousness, somehow make the film more lovable. The absurdity of Mortal Kombat's camp aesthetic is a big part of why it's remained such a cult classic. Oh, and also heads going. This is why we were puzzled to see how the screenwriter behind
kind of remake approached me telling this story. He told Polygon that with something like Mortal Kombat, where we're talking about soul-sucking sorcerers, it can very easily slip into canon. So right away, he's rejecting some of Mortal Kombat's DNA. He continued, I love the 95 film, but it drips in nacho cheese. But we were in 2021, and we wanted to deliver a movie that felt more authentic, a little more realistic. I mean, realistic isn't the first word that comes to mind when I see this. But okay, the decision to lean out from the camp factor is not so. The overall aesthetics of the newest installment are less colorful, less zany, and less punctuated with over-the-top set designs. Instead, and despite clearly having a bigger budget, the new film exercises far more visual restraint, settling for darker, bare shots, and simpler production design. Also, quite a bit of it takes place in the real world, which is depicted quite unremarkably. The camera angles air on the side of conventional, as compared to its predecessors' aforementioned widely canted angles and occasional broad show. The total differences between the two films are obvious from the first moments of the new film, which don't include the glorious theme song, but rather set up a true tragedy. In the 1995 version, when Liu Kang sees his brother get murdered, the fighting is over the top, rendered a near total caricature by the performances. It's not trying to tug at your heartstrings. In the new version, a woman and her child are murdered off screen by Killer Ice Guy in a moment conveyed through this guttural cry for help. Her husband, upon finding them dead, seeks a tearful revenge against the attackers, only to tragically be defeated. Here, they've built up a genuine drama which sets the tone for a film that is definitely not going to embrace the group factor. Except, Mortal Kombat isn't supposed to be about killing people's families. It's about melting a person's face with acid. And it feels like a bit of a contradiction to make a determinedly serious and gritty film when you literally have a character who's magical power is having a killer act. We can also see these kinds of problems in more one-to-one -one comparisons. Take the way Kano is murdered in each film. In the first, he's put into a deadly crotch hole and says, I'll kill you, Frank, and promptly has his neck broken by the sheer force of Sonya's thighs. It's ridiculous. It's goofy. In the new version, he's stabbed in the eye, emitting a guttural moan as he collapses to his death. Not exactly a lull moment. Similar lulls were lost in the new film's depiction of Goro, our favorite four-armed pal. Now, in the first, he's an absurd puppet who likes wrestling and has a penchant for going like. Even when he kills, it just feels kind of funny, as do the character's reactions to the death. In the new version, Goro's a scary CGI concoction who literally hunts down the main character's wife and child. Gone is any trace of the original's Kimbo Charm. When summing up our criticism of the new film, it's worth considering another quote from Sontag's seminal essay. When something is just bad, rather than can, it's often because it is too mediocre in ambition. The artist hasn't attempted to do anything really outlandish. This seems to sum up the problems of the Mortal Kombat remake to a T. It's a gore-filled film full of insanely over-the-top action, but infused with zero sense of humor, other than the occasional lame crack from Kane. Arms dealer, drug runner, murder for hire, scum of the earth. And also you really focus on and one brief shout out to the game's most annoying strategy. Yeah, the only movie not in this way, the film fails to hit the mark of outlandish in the way that its predecessor did so beautifully. But what do you guys think? Are we being too harsh on the remake? Is the 1995 version outdated or as lovable as ever? Let us know in the comments. As always, thanks to our patrons for all your support. Hit that subscribe button like you're splitting someone in half vertically with a deadly hat. And don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Peace.
Apache Coast. By 1950, a huge number of Americans lived in the suburbs and chased their ideals of the times, comfort, security, and home ownership, which is exactly what we see reflected in the TV sitcoms of that era. Shows like the Dick Van Dyke Show, and for the most part, the first two episodes of WandaVision depict the perfect version of the suburban utopia. The inhabitants own comfy homes with everything they need and have no real worries, or at least any that they seem willing to acknowledge. In other words, they fulfilled the American dream. And in WandaVision, it's only possible because Wanda, standing in the foundations where she planned to build her home, creates it by literally altering reality. The implication is pretty clear. It takes magic to achieve the unattainable goal of the suburban utopia. Within the hex, Wanda occupies a similar role to those of actual women living in real-life suburbs. Full-time housewife. She's eventually only concerned with planning the perfect evening for her husband, only to get sidetracked by a real-life or death situation. Most of her active desires within the hex are informed by the stereotypically feminine duties mid-century women were expected to perform. She keeps up the house, plans neighborhood parties, and takes care of the kids. While vision goes off to work, this strict adherence to gender roles was baked into the American suburban ideal and was reflected in the sitcoms that inspired Wanda's creation. In chasing the dream of suburban utopia, Wanda cast herself in that role. The thing is, if Wanda had been familiar with the that the suburban ideal had on women, perhaps she could have avoided the West View snafu altogether. You see, in the post-suburban boom of the early 60s, feminist thinker Betty Friedan analyzed the depression and malaise affecting suburban housewives. She found that most women were unsatisfied with their apparently perfect lives and the strict gender roles they occupied. They felt a lack of drive or purpose, often extending quick household tasks over the entire day Many turned to alcohol and prescription meds just to get through the day. But then also found that despite the majority of women feeling this way, they wouldn't discuss it with their peers. Because if everyone else around them seemed happy, surely they were the problem. We can feel this energy in Westview as Wanda tries to get along with her constantly grinning neighbors, who at first seem to be ideal suburban residents and not prisoners of sad, which mind that. Please help me. What days in? How long is it? Informed by both her research and her experience in the magazine industry, for Dan dubbed this phenomenon the feminine mystique. It's the false notion that the only thing women needed to live a fulfilling life was to glory in their own femininity, as defined by the culture at large. So according to society and mass media, all they needed for true happiness was to keep a house, take care of their husband, and raise the kids. These are the exact boundaries of the role Wanda cast herself in. And it's no coincidence that Friday employed in mass media, Wanda's main point of reference as a major contributor to the maintenance of the feminine mystique. The dominant media image of the happy family largely adhered to the feminine mystique, which reinforced the idea that women who weren't fulfilled were abnormal. What's more, media studies only came about around the mid-70s. So folks didn't have carefully crafted video essays to critically analyze these shows. Hmm. Wanda's consumption of sitcoms was also uncritical. She formed an entire coping mechanism around them, and being Sokovian wasn't close enough to American suburban life to examine it critically. It's unsurprising that she internalized these norms. It would be like if your whole conception of what Florida was like came from watching MTV's spring break specials from the 90s. If you rolled up to a modern-day Daytona Beach hoping to actualize what you had seen on the screen, you'd be sorely disappointed. Also, you'd probably have a new COVID variant that emerged from a phone call. All of this explains why Wanda was never going to be able to live a happy and trauma-free life within a sitcom-based hex. Regardless of all the uncontrolled chaos magic and interference from outside forces, but since this free day can help us understand Wanda's misery, she also can explain the satisfaction of watching Wanda escape. Free Dan argued that the only way for women to find fulfillment was to forge an identity outside of housewifeliness, saying that every woman must create, out of her own needs and abilities, a new life plan, fitting in the love and children and home that have defined femininity in the past with the work toward a greater purpose that shapes the we start to see Wanda doing just that. Aided in part by Agatha and Monica, she is able to break out of the feminine mystique and start to more intentionally create.
created a new life. This destruction of the hex and embrace of the new life still carries its own sense of loss and trauma, as it requires Wanda to say goodbye, slash, destroy her husband. Is
democracy. But on the other hand, it can actively stifle people from remixing or reacting to other creative work in a way that's entertaining. And we can understand that conflict best by looking at the man whose company basically created our modern intellectual property landscape, Walt Disney. See, in 1928, Walt created the character Oswald the Lucky Rabbit for Universal Studios. Oswald was a huge hit, but when Disney approached Universal about making more Oswald cartoons, he found out that the studio was already working on new Oswald shorts without him. And because they owned the rights, he couldn't do anything about it. Walt walked away fuming, and without the rights to this adorable bunny. It was then that Disney vowed to only work for himself, and that he would yeah. exclusive copyright to all the characters he and his company created. And now Disney owns the copyright to uh, basically every character any of us have cared about for the past 30 years. So, way to be, Walt. Anyway, as the story goes, in a bit of rage on his train ride home, Disney developed a brand new character that would belong to him and him alone. Mickey Mouse. Mickey, <laughs> Mickey and motherfucking Mouse. <laughs> Mickey was an unprecedented success. Being in control of his own intellectual property, Disney did what copyright law should encourage. He made more Mickey Mouse stuff, and uh, that worked out pretty well for him. And examples of copyright gone right are everywhere. In 1990, Screenwriter Art Buckwald sued Paramount Pictures for stealing his idea and turning it into Coming to America. He won the lawsuit and then settled with Paramount for $900,000, which was probably in their budget after the film brought in $288 million. And if someone takes your song and just repost it on YouTube, you can either get the ad money from it or block it entirely. And that's probably a good thing. So while copyrights have been super useful for many creators, these days it seems like it has a dark side. That is, so much stuff is protected by that C in a circle that a lot of folks think it's stifling creativity and making it impossible for artists to create new work derived from or inspired by existing culture. To get back to Walt, not only is he an example of why protecting your creative work is important, it's he's also super hard. That's what I'm doing. See, in super hard to create your own shit, but. You hunker down, you can do it. See, I got a spot for one more. Give me one more. Classic.
he created was going to work. So Congress goes out and makes the progress of science and useful art by securing for a limited time authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Laws well, enacted under the copyright laws created limited monopolies. That is, monopolies which give authors a good run but don't last forever. Early policies were deeply informed by a utilitarian theory of property. The idea is inventors and authors should be rewarded proportionally to how useful their creation is to consumers, and also that people make more useful stuff when they don't have to worry about people stealing it. Of course, the logic behind this isn't exactly perfect. It's kind of like arguing that if Disney wasn't able to copyright his own work, he would have been too lazy to create anything ever again. And maybe that's true, but as anyone who's gone to a show with Jennings knows, not every artist is in it for the money. <laughs> Still, English philosopher Jeremy Bentham argued that copyright laws incentivize inventors to make cool stuff by offering them a monopoly on the profits. He wrote that, without the assistance of the laws, the inventor would almost always be driven out of the market by his right, who finding himself without any expense in possession of a discovery which has cost the inventor much time and expense, would be able to deprive him of all of his reserved advantages by selling at a lower price. But this all seems pretty reasonable. Incentivize talented and smart people to make things by giving them the exclusive ability to profit off their idea. And then, once they melt in that little eureka moment for a long time, or, you know, die, it goes into the public domain so someone else can rip on it. What I'm saying is, if you ask the framers of the Constitution if Dr. Seuss's kid should be able to make money off of cartoons adapted from his books 30 years after his death, my guess is they say, nah. But Seuss's estate does still control and profit off of all sales of books in all terrific contexts. And because the Seusses still control what can be done with Seuss IP, we can't enjoy the Star Trek Dr. Seuss mashup book the masses were begging for. So what's the plan happen? Here's the thing. Until the early 1830s, copyright terms only lasted 14 years. And even by the time Disney created Mickey's Mouse, copyright only lasted 28 years. The Nazis were in for another 28 years. That would have meant Mickey Mouse would have become public domain. Thank you. I think Disney updated it to 70 years. In 1976, Congress gave the Copyright Act a complete overhaul with some guidance from a team of Disney lobbyists. See, what was that? His head was again not frozen in storage beneath the Pirates of the Caribbean ride in Disneyland, and the company's copyright on their iconic character was set to expire soon. They weren't too crazy about losing ownership of their coveted revenue generating blood. The resulting 1976 Act increased the term of copyright protection from 28 years to the life of the author plus 50 years. All in all, the lobbying efforts of Disney and other corporations kept Mickey locked up in Cinderella's castle until 2003. Goofy, Pluto, and Donald also got their Disney prison sentences extended, and it also became way easier to get sued for selling a crocheted pattern than sitting in Disney jail. Which I've, I've never visited, but universal jail, you know. And if you haven't Mickey Mouse is still not in the public domain. That's because in 1998, the Copyright Term Extension Act, or CTEA, was passed. Again, extending works for 70 years after yep. the author's death, and also protecting corporate work 70 years after death. Years Shit. Creation, or 120 years from their creation, whichever expires first. Which means, Flo won't be public property until, like, 2125. That makes that screenplay I wrote illegal. Anyway, people literally call this law the Mickey Mouse Protection Act because, duh. According to legal scholar Lori Richter, Disney spent $6.3 million lobbying for the extension. They even set up a political action committee, the Disney Act, and donated to senators who would eventually sponsor the CTEA. This was coupled with lobbying efforts from other folks, like musician George Gershwin. Which was and still is very concerned that Gershwin musicals might be sampled in rap music. Okay, dude. This all resulted in yet another extension for Mickey, as well as a handful of other characters that would have been in the public domain by now. But maybe you're thinking, so what if Disney wants to keep control of characters? Well, one criticism is that Disney is keeping control of characters adapted from the public domain, and that's really bad for art. Who, Snow White, The Little Mermaid, Cinderella, Aladdin, Hercules, Sleeping Beauty, Mulan, they were all taken from works that were in the public domain, which means they were available to the public and were not protected by copyright. Sure, now 
nowadays, you can try to make your own version of Mulan, but barring these rare exceptions, it's remarkably hard to have much success when a multinational corporation has a virtual monopoly on the characters you're creating and the story you're telling. That said, we can certainly try. Mockbusters aside, a bigger issue than Disney raiding the public domain while contributing nothing to it is that the copyright extensions they lobbied for have made hundreds of thousands of lesser known works completely unavailable and inaccessible. They just sit there, copyright extended, and companies holding on to them to maybe one day turn them into something. Who knows what creative derivative work might have come from them? After all, great works ranging from Goethe's Faust to West Side Story were also derivatives of other stories. Many scholars feel that copyright extension well beyond the author's death is far from utilitarian. Increasing in copyright protection can actually harm the public more than they benefit authors, especially when those authors are dead and definitely not frozen beneath a pirate ride, and the new authors are multinational corporations. One argument lobbyists and copyright enthusiasts use is something called the tragedy of the commons argument. Coined by Garrett Hardin in 1968, the tragedy of the commons stipulates that open shared access to a resource will cause overuse and destruction of that resource. So, like open farmland, an idea being open and shareable will only be harmful. But research shows that copyright correlates more with the disappearance of works than with their availability to the masses. In a study, how copyright keeps works disappeared, scholar Paul Field analyzed large samples of both Amazon books and songs and found that shortly after works are created and propertized, they tend to disappear from public view only to reappear in significantly increased numbers when they fall into the public domain and lose their owners. Like how Marvel is totally sitting on countless forgotten villains and heroes who may never return to print or make it to the big screens. Or how there hasn't been a movie yet about Namor, the king of Atlantis, because of copyright disputes between Marvel and Universal. Another legal scholar, Michael Heller, calls this the tragedy of the anti-commons. Heller argues that while privatizing a commons might stop wasteful overuse, it can also cause wasteful underuse. That is to say, when everything is copyrighted and the landscape becomes so fragmented, it becomes very difficult to make something new. The public can't access these things, but competitive copyright owners don't collaborate with each other either. It might be helpful to think about the public domain as a warehouse of ideas, authors can reuse, sample, change, and incorporate into other works. If the warehouse isn't well stocked, people don't have pre-existing cultural materials to work from. Some of Europe's most well-regarded composers wrote incredible pieces by freely printing music that no one particularly owned. And take this little tune you might remember from The Lion King. It comes from an old church Gregorian chant that would also make its way into a piece of Mozart and then Come on, there we go. Sorry about that. Another by Franz Liszt. And then another by Gustav Holst. And then the Sweeney Todd musical. And Jethro Tolkien. That is to say, Idea spreading freely is often, but not always, a very good thing. But the real tragedy is that another warehouse of ideas is fully stocked, but no one's allowed in there except the owner, who checks in like once every 20 years. The one saving grace that sometimes lets us breach the anti commons at least in art and media, is something called fair use. It permits the use of unlicensed copyrighted work under certain circumstances, like parody, education, commentary, and criticism. It's how Wisecrack gets away with showing clips from lots of movies and TV shows without getting sued. So far, the underlying argument for fair use is as utilitarian as Jeremy Bentham's position on copyright. Types of reuse under fair use are allowed because they benefit the public as a whole and they don't hurt the original creator in any measurable way. The downside of fair use is that it's a legal defense. That means that if you want to fight a copyright strike by claiming fair use, you have to go to down. There, everything is evaluated under a complicated set of criteria. How much of the copyrighted work is used? What is its effect on the market? How much is it transformed? But going to court may or may not be worth it for either party involved, but in some cases it's probably 
better than paying unaffordable licensing fees to studios. Having anti-commons doesn't just mean that we never see character crossovers from competing companies anymore. It's way scarier than that. Because intellectual property isn't just art and books and media. It's also things like drug patents. Heller gives the example of a drug company that found a potential treatment for Alzheimer's disease. In order to develop it, they needed access to dozens of other patents. The owners of those patents demanded exorbitant sums of money, and some even blocked the whole deal. The company was never able to get access to the patents. The drug, which might have saved millions of lives, sits on a shelf. It kind of seems like all these patents and intellectual property rights are not benefiting the public. Between terrifying stories like that and the artists feeling smothered by giant corporations that own everything, it's not surprising that a host of groups have popped up advocating for changes, ranging from the elimination of biopatents to the legalization of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. These include Creative Commons, which advocates for more flexible and open copyright laws so that creators don't have to resort to fair use as a defense. Others argue for the complete abolition of copyright laws and encourage creative piracy until those laws change. Groups like the League of Noble Peers promote the movement against intellectual property, while pirate cinema literally screens movies without licensing. Meanwhile, Mickey Mouse is set to enter the public domain in 2024. The jury's still out oh, shit. and lobbyists will convince Congress to extend copyright rights again. Hopefully they won't, and we can finally release our limited edition Mickey Jailbreak. But what do you guys think? Should we abolish copyright altogether, or change the laws to give a little more flexibility to creators and artists? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to our incredible patrons. Slam that subscribe button like you're Mickey Mouse trying to break out of the patent office, and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later. Straight Talk Wireless has coverage for your phone with the new Platinum Unlimited plan, which includes mobile protect. Just 65 bucks a month for unlimited talk, text, and data, plus more. All the best networks. Straight Talk Wireless. No contract, no compromise. Find you. Hey, Watch Tracks. Michael here. Today, we're talking about some of the most gross, depraved losers ever to marinate a ham in rum. This is ham, soaked in rum. Whether they're running a door-to-door -door gas scheme, well, you're looking all sorts of good, or in the bed, you know you did it. That's up. I did not poop the bed. Whoa, 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 rewind. The Patty crew are terrible friends, seemingly determined to force each other to make the worst possible choices and to live their worst possible life. But no matter how bad things get for the gang, they never seem to be able to escape one another. It's worth asking the question, why don't they all just Believe. What is the strange glue that binds them together, and what might their destructive tendencies tell us about our own friendships? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on It's Always Sunny, how your friends can ruin you. Now, before we dive into the game's bad behavior, I want to give a quick second to shout out this week's sponsor, Noom. It's, ironically, a behavior change innovator, which helps people who are looking to become healthier and maybe lose some weight. Noom uses science and psychology to teach people how to live life. They help you learn how your mind works so you can develop lasting habits. Other programs focus on quick fixes, bad diets, and they'd like to teach people about healthy habits. With Noom, you can focus on non-scale goals and take daily lessons to learn about why certain foods are healthier than others, how to break your thought distortions, and how to motivate yourself on the day-to-day. -day. When you join Noom, you'll be set up with a personal goal specialist who is trained in psychology, fitness, and nutrition. I love that you can join group chats. It's so much easier to stay motivated who are on the same type of health journey as you. And check out Noom today by clicking the link in the description. Take the quick and easy online evaluation to create your custom plan. Now, back to the show. Sitcoms are often about people trapped together by circumstance, whether that be work, familial relations, or um, by virtue of being the last remaining humans on Earth. And the comedy results from these situations, which bind the characters together, whether they like it or not. Conventions, of course, are meant to be broken. For instance, Seinfeld is often described as a show about nothing, and 
part what these all combine to Jerry and his friends together is that they are neurotic, self-centered assholes with no ability to learn or grow. But I'm disturbed. I'm depressed. I'm inadequate. I've got it all. All of a sudden, you could be seen as a somewhat straightforward development of Seinfeld. Ostensibly, the gang is trapped together because they co-own Caddy's pub. But All of a Sunny is in no way a normal workplace comedy a la Cheers. No. Oh my god. Oh jeez. Bro, I really, I just missed him. Beginning with the arrival of the absurdly rich Frank in season two, the gang hasn't relied on Caddy's for income, and so the bar has come to function as a sort of clubhouse. Running it is something the characters only bother to do when they can serve as a site for one of their schemes. And though some of the characters are related, the show is in no way a family comedy. What you mean?
It is a sitcom about the struggle for recognition. <laughs> it's Always Sunny isn't the only show to deal with recognition. The theme plays a big role in more traditional sitcoms as well. On the typical show, however, the recognition shared by the characters helps them become better versions of themselves. Like how in an episode of The Office, Pam may feel like a failure about her art show, only to be uplifted by Mike, who recognizes her as a serious artist. So the gang is far from unique in relying on one another for recognition. What distinguishes them, however, is the fact that they are so bad. Unlike our friends up in Spring, who will eventually can see positive traits in one another, down in Philly, recognition is used as a tool for destruction and dysfunction. But what exactly is the gang doing wrong? To truly understand their dysfunction, we need to talk about the three primary forms of social recognition. These are love, legal recognition, and All right. Now, what is this? The Alexander Gallery? Yeah. So. Alexander Gallery Study. There we go. All right, so we moved on to some more of his uh, paintings to, to study those, and they got a little more intricate which is kind of what I was looking for, except for this one. But again, this looks just like the same as all these things, where it's just kind of like a fur thrown over, a rug thrown over, a piece of leather thrown over, with uh, some sort of string tying it up. So I guess it's just the way it works, man. I, you know. Which, sure, I can do. I can do that. I can get down with that. And yeah, I mean, not really given anything to to work with as far as like understanding goes. Like I don't know where the chain mail ends and the belt begins and what's holding this piece of fur up. You know, but it's interesting to think that maybe it's like wrapped around in some sort of way when you have like this line here, that line there. Things like that. This one looks just like a, a fur thrown over with a a whole leather piece of underwear that seems to cut through underneath the pants as well or underneath the pants like cut through uh, between the legs you know and him having some leather straps going across his chest here is very uh, synonymous with the like military stuff with the straps that they have cutting across their chests uh, well, they're not in any of these pictures. They're in the ones in the corner here. But you see, they have like chest straps cutting across this way. You know, he probably has some going on right here. But either way, just straps like that. So it's interesting, you know, to see kind of old school stuff, new school stuff, and see how it all worked out for them. But... Yeah, I don't know uh, if I'm going to be doing another page of this or not. I, that was the entire Alexander Gallery. And going through just to look for these sort of things specifically, I pretty much found everything that I needed to. Um, so if I did continue this, it would be with another, going through another book. And I don't know how necessary it is. The only benefit I would have to it is, this is kind of like the gold for me right here, are these four squares. As far as like capturing this concept and understanding this idea, it's like, okay, I got this. I can do that. If I ever had to animate a character clothing themselves in, with that sort of apparel, it'd be like, oh, okay, I, I, you know, I, I got the concept. I can do it. And then, um, yeah, the only benefit of continuing this with like his actual finished works and things like that, and maybe even including women, but I don't think the women is necessary. It's all basically bikinis. Uh... But even, 
just continuing it otherwise would be just getting like more details and things like that and understanding where really none of this really makes sense to me. It's like, okay, he has one belt here. He has another belt there. He has a leather thing going on here and he has some fur going on. So you can imagine he has like a fur with leather uh, piece over it. And then over that leather piece, he has like two belts, one thick double belt that's holding up like this sword since it seems to be matching. And then this thinner one that could be holding this dagger and things like that. Um, either way, uh, yeah, you know, this stuff is cool, and, and to be honest, it's, it's fun to draw, and it, it really doesn't take much thinking on my part, you know, when I do these, uh, these streams normally, they take three to four hours, and even though I'm working on the same size things, you see me, you know, X these things out, what is this, uh, not even two hours, I did these pictures, so these aren't even 30 minutes to draw, while you know I could work on the same scale on other pieces like uh, like this and end up spending four hours on it it's not just because I'm coloring it and rendering it out it's because I'm kinda of making it up as I go and there's a lot of thought that has to go into this and there really isn't any thought that has to go into this it's kinda of like just look and recreate and hopefully my mind picks something up as I do it and really the only thing that my mind's picking up is like you know, just create it and like, like draw what I want to draw and it really doesn't have to make sense too much. And just make it look cool. I guess that's the most important thing is make it look cool. So, um, maybe that's what I end up ha have to do when, end up having to have to do when I uh, work on these, uh, some of these characters that I'm, that I plan on doing. But yeah, um, like I said, I'll have to find that can of fixative and 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 buy it and just psh, psh, put these pages down. I avoid drawing with pencil just because even on my old sketchbooks, like the pages get extremely dirty over the years because the lead starts to run off. So the fixative will at least kind of put on a clear coat to um, protect these pages from dirtying up over over time. You know, they're already starting to get dirty. You can see like on, on the edge of the page here. That's coming from the, the stuff drawn over here, which is crazy. Either way, that's going to be the end of this one, man. I'm G Mr. Drew. That's at G Mr. Drew on all social media. You can follow, like, and subscribe. Any and all support and connection is appreciated. Um, you know, uh, you can check out my website, gmrdrew.art. All of those links are in my bio, so you can check those out there. Um, I appreciate a follow. If you're, you know, just watching this for the first time, I'm doing stuff like this all the time. Normally creating my own things, not necessarily studies, but, you know, this was fun. You know, I, um, it might be a thing for me to do as uh, in between working on my original pieces to do some studies, uh, especially with my new schedule. Uh, my brain tends to die late into the night, and but I have time to stream and it's just I have no brain power. So if I could do studies... Uh, which don't require any brain power. It just requires me to move my hand in, in specific directions. It's more physical than mental. You know, that might be the, uh, that might be the ticket. So we might be uh, entering a hodgepodge of me creating ori my original content and continuing my, my story content, as well as uh, me doing more studies like this and, you know, getting a wide breadth, a, a wide variety of work that I do. It's like I say, man, I you know, kind of draw anything and everything. That's why I always offer my freelance services. If you want a, an illustration, just hit me up. Let me know. You can contact me through my bio, through my website, um, all that stuff. If you follow me on Instagram, there's an email link in there. You can just email me. I have work orders and everything like that. I can shoot to you and, you know, we can get this thing going. Uh, otherwise, you could join my Patreon, G Mr. Drew on Patreon. And you enter certain tiers and you get free, you get, a uh, not free, but you get, um, I was going to say you get freelance, but really you get, uh, uh, sketch cards and things like that, uh, and, and original illustrations from me. And, you know, let's say you want like a picture of Wolverine or something, you know, I could draw you Wolverine depending on the tier will be a digital or traditional copy and, you know, anything and everything can be tailored to whatever you want. Um, 
But yeah, man, let, let, let's close this out. You've been watching the Andrew Glosheski Experience episode 146, doing some Frazetta girdle studies. Uh, I think I'm kind of good. I might have to just jump forward and move on and 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 to the to the next original character um, from from my map. Where's my map at? From this map over here, and we're gonna uh, let's focus. We're gonna be focusing next on characters from uh, the border here. I don't know if I'm ready to venture out into here just yet, but we're for sure gonna go into this area as well as these areas over here and you know again we're just working our way up the map so yeah we're going to be hitting up these borders and then i don't know what will be next if it's going to be up here or over here but either way it's all going to be fun it's all going to be good it's all going to be cool and yeah man i hope to see you there for that so again thank you love you i'll be back man y'all stay good